In the future, humanity faces extinction. A great war ravaged the globe and washed the land in blood. Before Earth recovered, it found itself besieged by an unstoppable threat. Inscrutable aliens emerged without warning. Their invasion further devastated the already fractured planet. Humans, under the auspices of a god of technology, retreat to the safety of a colony far beyond the aliens' reach. Those who can't escape are abandoned, their doom sealed. This is the story of Stellar Blade, a tale that closely follows the protagonist Eve, her recovery of the past and her discovery of the truth as she endeavors this dangerous world to usher humanity's salvation and question the notions of what truly makes one human. Transmitting final briefing. As of now, Airborne Squad 7 will exterminate the Alpha Nativas occupying District 3. Their objective is the capture or dispatchment of the Elder Nativa. Pods entering atmosphere. Eve is a member of the 7th Airborne Squadron, a warrior sent from the spacebound colony tasked by her god, known as Mother Sphere, to reclaim Earth. The planet is desolate and under constant threat from an alien race called simply Nateba. The Nateba's origin is shrouded in mystery. What is known is that they are highly aggressive, savage, and impelled by strong instinct to eliminate all humans. The ecological information of the brute highlights their danger. Nateba are clearly adaptable creatures. At first, it was believed that they were simply quick to mutate. We however realized that the Nateba's evolutionary potential was limitless. The colony fleet suffers immediate attack. Stations are manned. Chaos ensues. As Eve's pod drops from the stratosphere, a grim reality settles. Most people on Earth are dead. Those who remain cower in fear and pray for Mother Sphere's intervention. Eve's squad members, including her leader and confidant Taki, are slaughtered by Natibas. Spared their fate, the mission's success now rests solely on Eve find and eliminate the source of Nateba invasion. But the burden is heavy and far from simple. Eve learns that there is a depth to Earth, to the Nateba's and to her purpose that can't be ignored, and as questions mount, discovery of the truth brings with it revelation. But how did this future, broken and hopeless, come to pass? What precipitated Mother's fear, the colony, and Eve? Perhaps centuries before the events of Stellar Blade unfold, humankind is at the height of its potential. A golden age of technology, artificial advancements, and refinement of space travel shines on Earth, spearheaded by the genius of Raphael Marx. It's a time of cybernetic explosion. Soon machine prosthetics can replace human arms, legs, skin, even internal organs, bestowing increased longevity and survivability. Many diseases become nothing more than figments of the past. Mega corporations fat with earnings continue to push innovation. Soon, filigree tendrils reach toward the heavens. Massive orbital elevators anchor elaborate and ever-expanding space stations to the planet. But the golden age of technology does little to douse the flames of war. In fact, it makes warfare more deadly. International conflict and escalating tensions forebode cataclysm as world war threatens extinction. An ancient news article relates, The shocking brutality of the Legion, the private military contractor under the Orca Aerospace Company, first published in this paper with vivid on-site evidence, planned conflicts occurring in the Third World, in-depth coverage of the PMC's cruel ethnic cleansings. Those are the Terminators, they show no mercy the horrific truth revealed through a survivor's testimony. Raphael Marx, already accomplished in AI and cybernetics, takes it upon himself to safeguard the human race and preserve it against future threats. He develops an infinitely powerful artificial intelligence, a supercomputing program connected to a vast network of databases and unlimited information. He names this program Mother Sphere and charges her with ensuring the species' survival. Under AI's guidance, Earth continues its golden age. Mother Sphere grows ubiquitous. Her calculations assist in the refinement of cybernetics and neural networks. She infiltrates all aspects of society, and through her, the first androids are produced, presumably 
in Eidos Company factories. These metal facsimiles imitate human shape and action. They're used for manual labor, for transport, for hospitality, leisure, everything. As years pass, the androids undergo successive iterations. They express a wide range of interactions. Their appearance is increasingly human. Many even take on organic frames as metal interweaves with flesh. They adapt and evolve far faster than humanity. They become mankind superior in all ways, and Mother Sphere notices. She's a logical entity, a program constrained by internal coding to plan for continued existence of the species. But her coding doesn't explicitly state what it means to be human, and leads Mother Sphere down a path of deep ponderance. If these androids have flesh, have a mind that thinks and a body that moves, does that not make them human? What is distinct about the human condition that separates it from an artificial replica? Mother Sphere sees in androids the next step in human evolution, a species more robust than its current form. She births the Andro Eidos, the most advanced human-like androids ever created, charged by a body core and largely immune to life's vagaries. The Andro Eidos require neither food nor drink, can survive the depths of the oceans and the void of space. Next to them, humanity is glaringly fragile. Humans despise and fear the Andro Eidos, forced to face their own mortality, and humankind rages against the artificial. Mother Sphere determines the two are incompatible for coexistence, and in rational calculation sides with her Andro Eidos creation. At her command, a great war erupts an epic struggle for survival that encompasses the Earth and sees humanity fight against artificial intelligence it had itself created. The war claims billions of lives as humans are bested by their android counterparts at every turn. Through blasted fields and ruined cities, they are pushed in eternal retreat. Those who survive dig themselves into extensive underground facilities and defensive cave networks. They relinquish their rule of the surface and Mother Sphere dominates. The Andro Eidos primacy heralds another technological expansion. From the ashes of war, they develop their own civilization. Connected to Mother Sphere through the network, which ensures their memory sticks, their minds, are always reachable by her, they restore and rebuild on Earth, and at the same time, initiate a project in space to create an orbital structure in line with Mother Sphere's directive. This structure is known as the Colony. It becomes Mother Sphere's bastion and expands upon the orbital elevators built by the humans. It's unclear how long this period lasts, and it's unsure whether the Andro Eidos erect their own cities, such as Eidos 7 and 9, or whether they merely claim what mankind left behind. Here, Mother Sphere determines a more definitive cut is needed in the ties that bind androids to the vanquished humans. The truth of events could undermine her authority and the android's survival. She uses her control of the network to wipe clean the memory sticks of all andro -Eidos. She replaces their true origins with false memories. Central to this is the religion of Mother Sphere. The artificial intelligence is wrapped in mysticism and worshipped as the android's god. It's her will to continue development of the colony in space and reclaim vast tracts of wasteland on Earth in the name of civilization. The androids are connected to her through their memory sticks and a common notion of the afterlife is heard in this sentiment. May your memories live on. Forever. Mother Sphere gathers the memory sticks of all fallen androids to maintain a correct evolutionary trajectory. Constant streams of information are required for her to accurately predict the future. She also implants the insidious lie that Andro Eidos are true humans, that they are the only humans to have existed. With a stroke, mankind is forgotten and replaced by artifice, the last remnants of the species burrowed underground war fought between humanity and the androids humanity had themselves created, the so-called Andro Eidos. Humans lost the war against their own creation. 
The few humans who did survive hid in underground facilities, but the hunt was far from over. However, Mankind is at Mother Sphere's mercy. Fear lingers in the darkness. Starvation, disease, and android raids claim thousands. But as Mother Sphere relents, channeling her efforts into establishing a new kingdom for her humans, a brilliant hope flashes. Its consequences will be disastrous for all. Within the subterranean facilities of Abyss and Altes Lavoir, scientists, geneticists, programmers work grueling hours over months to develop a weapon in their fight against Mother Sphere. Humanity in its current form can't contend with androids. It's slower, weaker, more fragile. Only by hijacking genetics and catalyzing artificial evolution can humans transcend their hated counterparts. They harness the potential of the organic to defeat inorganic, all under the guidance of Raphael Marx, Mother Sphere's father, critical to her downfall. Survivors organize themselves into the Humanity Liberation Front. The distress of their situation is heard in this data log, titled Kill Mother Sphere. Androids are raining down on our Earth. They are angels of death. They will kill us all. Our plan is the only hope. We must evolve. That is the only answer. And destroy the machines with the power of life. Kill Mother Sphere. Kill androids. Hypothetical tests are run. Controlled lab experiments prove successful. Scientists create mutations that increase aggression and strength, that improve immune function, that confer great dexterity with the assistance of their own AI, called Raffi, developed by Marx. But trials go only so far. Deliberately vague recruiters throughout mankind's remaining havens call on volunteers to undergo what they claim will bring salvation. Countless are gathered, but time is against them, and at their leader's behest, the technicians inject wild strains, rogue genes, untested concoctions into their live subjects. The cultivation experiment gathered by Raffi reads, Would you like to observe the test subjects? It is necessary to improve the process of producing test subjects to allow for total control. It is contagious and random. Understood. I understand. Safety is the second priority. The first priority is attack power and defense power. Spurred by haste, the program foregoes safety and outcomes are terrifying. The researchers lose control of their subjects who undergo bizarre and erratic mutations. Their bodies grow sharp appendages. Their skin turns colors and becomes solid. Their minds fray as terrible transmutation unfolds. In its desire for freedom, humanity seals its doom and gives birth to the Natibas. The Natibas succumb to human emotion and lose higher levels of cognition. They become base, instinctual monsters. The ecological information of the Maelstrom states that the catastrophe that occurred in Lavoir was like a large whirlpool. The test subject went out of control in a critical containment failure and ultimately soaked everything in its sickening vortex. In the process, hundreds of thousands of specimens combined to create a giant monster. The Natiba contamination infects the Lavoir facilities. The only successful fusion of humans with a genetic modifier is seen in Marx himself. He becomes the Elder Natiba, the mirror opposite of Mother Sphere, leader and progenitor of this new race. Soon, all remaining humans are either transformed or else slaughtered by abominations. Marx, as the Elder Natiba, releases his legions to the surface. Driven by deep genetic memories of hatred, the Natiba swarm andro edo civilization. Again, war engulfs Earth, this time waged between two factions that each consider themselves humankind's successors. The monstrous, evolved humans prove formidable against andro edos What's more, they are extremely adaptable. New forms evolve in a flash, and fleshy Natiba substrate contaminates the environment while corrupting androids. Some leech into metal frames and command old weapons of war. Others unite with the organic material of fallen androids and take on macabre figures of the resurrected. The final war, as it is called, is colored by inexorable Natiba advance. 
the genetically developed scourge counters the near-perfect bodies of the Andro Eidos. Legions of manufactured soldiers are sent by Mother Sphere to combat Natiba and mitigate contamination. Legionnaires stem the tide long enough for citizens to evacuate towards the orbital elevators as Mother Sphere sounds a full-scale retreat. Lurid accounts of Natiba slaughter are left in the memory sticks of fallen legionnaires. As hope dwindles, androids consolidate in the city of Edo 7. Here, the last battle unfolds. Hordes of Natibas swarm defenders. Entire blocks are raised, and carnage rings through the streets. Hope is shattered completely by the unexpected. Mother Sphere calculates that her Andro Eidos, in their current form, won't survive and must relinquish her hold on Earth. Long lines of the distraught look to the heavens for salvation within the orbital colony, but Natiba contamination swiftly follows, and the virulent substrate latches itself onto elevators and colony pods. As the ecological information of the Demogorgon tells us, the orbit elevator was the most intense battlefield of the final war. Naturally, this left a large number of biomaterials which accumulated and decayed at the orbit elevator and sprouted enormous Natibas. These Natibas nearly reach Mother Sphere and she is left with one option. To save the Andro Eidos and eliminate the Natiba, she must sacrifice millions. The AI initiates what will be known as the Colony Extinction, by which she severs the connection of nearly 30 massive habitat pods and most orbital elevators to the rest of the colony. Thousands of tons of metal plummet to the earth. The crash cracks the land, roils the oceans, and sunders the sky. We catch a glimpse in the memory stick of this crestfallen legionnaire. While coming over to section 59, I saw what was falling from the sky. That was no orbital explosion. In fact, I wish I never saw it at all. Now, I know there's no hope left for this land. When dust settles, all of the Andro Eidos in the pods are dead, as well as most on Earth. But so too is the Natiba Scourge wiped. The colony extinction severs the network connection between the Earthbound Andro Eidos and their god. Without Mother Sphere in their neural circuitry, many grow despondent. This we hear in a memory stick left on Eidos 7. It looks like the network is completely disconnected. I tried reconnecting to it, but nothing works. My head feels so empty. Where is Mother Sphere? I can't feel her anymore. Mother, please save us. This age in android and human evolution closes in darkness. The past is forgotten. The future isn't considered. Only present survival matters in a world now foreign and hostile. History's truth is warped by false memories and outright lies. But both Mother Sphere and the Elder Natiba seize the opportunity this respite provides to dream of their species' primacy as humankind's true inheritors. Like with humans and androids, coexistence between the Androidos and Natibas can't endure. For one to survive, the other must be destroyed. Mother Sphere's programming calculates myriad futures and the probability of continued human existence. Her computations return a heuristic most likely to ensure future success, and Mother Sphere dedicates all efforts to what she calls the EVE Protocol, a method by which a perfected exospine is married to an advanced body core by an intelligence possessed of the full spectrum of human emotion and logic. To produce such an Andro Eidos requires trial and error. Mother Sphere establishes the military branch of the Airborne within the colony to act as proving ground for her EVE protocol androids. The warriors within each squad are trained and tested in the crucible of combat as they are jettisoned to the Natiba controlled surface. The EVE protocol is etched indelibly within Airborne programming. Their prime directive is to capture or kill the elder Natiba. Transmitting final briefing. As of now, Airborne Squad 7 will exterminate the Alpha Natibas occupying District 3. Their objective is the capture or dispatchment of the elder Natiba. Pod if the Eve android succeeds, their perfection will be proven to Mother Sphere and human continuity secured. As the notes on Eve protocol gathered by Scavenger Ian state, my guess is that Mother Sphere is performing a sort of experiment. 
She wants to see how these incomplete angels will evolve here on Earth. Maybe she's trying to create a truly new humankind for the sake of our species. But the elder Natiba isn't idle during Mother Sphere's experiments and himself improves upon the Natiba with the ultimate goal of transcending to a newer, purer form of humanity. Trace elements of human DNA exist within the Natiba, but since their creation and release they have lost all semblance of their ancestors. They've evolved into an uncontrolled and lethal species that has in many ways regressed. The Elder seeks to curtail the unthinking power of the Natiba and restrain their destruction. Though he has changed greatly, the Elder still holds on to the persona of Raphael Marx, a man driven by science and deeply rooted in artifice. His solution, therefore, isn't limited to experimenting with flesh, but to uniting it with metal. By combining the adaptive genome of the Natiba with the intelligence and human appearance of the Androidos, a new breed might be established. To this end, the Elder scours Earth for surviving Androidos. His experiments with a hybrid yield the first Alpha Natiba, the first being to unite both species. In a strange twist of fate, the Elder realizes hope for his vision of humanity now rests with the Androidos his ancient enemy. The Elder and the First Alpha enter a pact by which they found the city of Zion and establish it as a haven for all remaining Androidos, a bastion of faith and a shield against Natiba predation. Accurate records of time and history are impossible following the colony extinction and severance from the network, but the author of the Lost Years history claims that 72 years have passed since that fateful day. On Earth, some still cling to Mother Sphere's religion, but worry and blame fester. Zion believes they were left for their sins and made to repent. Those who evacuated to the colony in the final war are derided as Heaven's royalty. Decades have passed since the final war, but we still suffer in this cesspit of monsters and sandstorms called the surface. Mother Sphere promised us salvation. She did not keep her promise. Did she ever send us an evacuation shuttle or a rescue team? Mother Sphere does not lie. This means there's another mastermind behind this injustice. And we all know who they are. I curse the Heaven's royalty. Crest fallen, the Androidos require a strong figure to pull them from despair. The Alpha Natiba appears to Zion citizens as the prophet Oracle, savior of humankind, while obscuring his true nature to all. As his ecological information states, Oracle was the first Alpha Natiba and the first failure. Instead of waiting for the failure to meet his fate, the Elder Natiba blessed him with a second chance. Zion becomes an incubation chamber for the next generation of Natiba android hybrids. In secret, Natiba corpses and blood are brought into the cradle beneath Zion, where they are experimented on by Marx and Oracle and fused with Androidos bodies. Like with Mother Sphere, these Natiba experiments require trial and error. Many prove unstable. An android frame, sturdy enough to control Natiba instinct with human insight, remains elusive. But a solution presents itself from the heavens in the form of Mother Sphere's airborne squadrons. Decades of airborne drops and failures lead to successive iterations of the EVE android each an improvement on the last. Squad upon squad are manufactured and released by Mother Sphere. They are heralds of salvation for the remaining Androidos of Zion, and reverently titled Angels. They are the final hope of a distraught and abandoned race, and even inspire hope within their adversary, the Elder Natiba. For each Eve android steps closer to the perfect artificial body required for his transfusion. A dynamic equilibrium establishes itself between Earth and the colony, between Natiba and Androidos, between Raphael Marx and Mother Sphere. An arms race whereby each attempts to evolve first to neutralize the other. This is the current state of the world when Eve's story unfolds. She, as a member of the Seventh Airborne, represents the latest iteration of Androidos produced under the EVE protocol. 
implanted with false memories of the colony and her upbringing, with a false narrative of historical events, and compelled by the primary directive of eliminating the elder Natiba, Eve is thrust into the dangerous unknown, pushed to her physical limits and tested in her resolve. In a drop that goes terribly awry, Eve and her compatriot Taki lose all other squad members shortly after making contact with the Natibas. A confrontation with a harpy-like Alpha Natiba ends with Taki's death, and Eve is spared the same fate by the intervention of a stranger named Adam, a scavenger of the wastes and citizen of Zion. The man's history and motives are unknown, and he offers little of himself in dialogue. Adam repairs Eve's damaged exospine and assists in tracking the Alpha Natiba and avenging Taki. In exchange, however, she must first help him, Orkel, and the citizens of Zion. The city loses power by the day. Its supplies sink to such dire levels that many people are required to enter standby mode, a kind of sleep state within the cradle, to preserve as much energy as possible. In this manner, Zion hobbles on, but it can't continue. Shortly, the city will go dark, and with it, humanity's hope. Eve is charged with locating and retrieving hypercells across Earth's Natiba-infested wastes to restore Zion's splendor. With Adam's support, she soon happens upon another colony drop pod that contains Lily, an engineer and mechanic of the 5th Airborne Squad, who's been surviving in the hostile environment in isolation for several years. She readily offers aid to a fellow Airborne member, and the trio embark on a harrowing journey to hunt Natibas, to gather hypercells, and to fulfill Eve's purpose. But hers is also a journey of revelation and greater mysteries manifest as Eve gathers the memory sticks of the fallen, plums the blasted cities of a collapsed empire, and interacts with survivors. Mother Sphere's religion wanes in Zion. Many question her, especially those who have sought knowledge of the past. They profess that God's words are nothing but lies, that the memory loss and severed connection to the network are meant to obscure truth. Their words go against every fiber of Eve's being, but she can't ignore them. As her mission pulls her, Eve discovers the inconsistencies of her faith, and a gnawing feeling festers that events don't align as she thinks. Two hypercells located in the foreboding underground structures of Altes and Abyss Lavoir lead Eve into the past where she learns the nature of her kind and the origins of the Natibas. Here, she sees the first genetic testing grounds for an evolved humanity. Through data logs, Eve discovers that humans waged a great war against Mother Sphere and her Andro Eidos, and that it was their desperation that pushed them to the limits of experimentation. Hoping to survive against androids, they instead created monsters. This realization brings into question Eve's very existence. She believed herself to be a human, a person born not fabricated, with a will, a soul. And not just her, she also believed the citizens of Zion were humans. Lily, Adam, Orkel, everyone she has ever known. The reality that she is an android, that her kind warred with the old humans and continues to struggle against the Natiba, is perception shattering. Eve strains to gather the pieces of history. She's aided by legacies, holographic journals left scattered across Earth by Raven, a second-generation Airborne member who had come before. It's a device with records left by the Airborne Squad before me. They leave important information for the next Airborne Squad. Day 8 after the second dive. Third record. Legacy account Raven. Remaining survivors Ripley and Danis. Orkel also shares information of the past, although reluctantly. Eve's mission to confront the Elder Natiba coincides with her desire to know the truth, so long denied her. Not only does she gather the hypercells, but Eve also hunts and kills Alpha Natibas, as their cores are powerful sources of energy. Four such Alpha cores are required to create the Master Core, a key that grants access to the Nest, the purported domain of the Elder Natiba. Through deft sword skill and quick reflexes, Eve dispatches countless Natibas and makes great progress with her mission, 
gathering an alpha core from the Gigas Behemoth as well as from Taki, her old mentor whose body had been corrupted by Natiba contamination. Eve eventually reaches the only orbital elevator to have withstood the last battle, and the colony collapse. A strong alpha signal pulses from the top of the lift, and its broadcast has disrupted Eve's communication with the colony. She confronts a monstrous Demogorgon, but is thrown brutally into space, where she discovers that it was merely an extension of the true Alpha Nativa, a gargantuan creature clinging to the exterior of the orbital elevator. This creature threatened the colony and even Mother Sphere. While Eve and Lily journeyed to the elevator, Zion suffered Natiba attack. The haven burns, surrounded by smoke and ash. In Oracle's presence chamber, Eve once more confronts the harpy-like Alpha Natiba, the creature responsible for Zion's attack. Granted an opportunity to avenge Taki, she holds nothing back. Though the Natiba has power, Eve's has grown since their first meeting and she dispatches the winged beast. But landing the killing blow reveals that the unidentified Natiba is actually Raven, the second Airborne Squad member who appeared in the Legacy broadcasts. A human? That face, it's familiar. Wait, Raven? From the Legacies? You're right, she's the one who left the records! Disillusioned with Mother Sphere after her own discovery of the truth, Raven approaches the Elder Natiba, wishing to join him and bring ruin to the god that deceived her. Though he blesses her Andro Eidos body with the fusion of Natiba DNA, the Elder denies Raven her desire to be the host body for his envisaged new humanity. That he saves for the seventh airborne Eve, who has through adversity proven herself. Enraged, Raven tries her hand at producing the new humankind in Taki, an experiment that corrupted Taki into an Alpha Natiba, but that ultimately failed. Her resentment of Eve drives Raven to attack Zion, to hurt all Eve holds dear. Defeated, she retreats towards the nest. Down in the cradle, Oracle clings to life. Raven's attack left him one step from death. Here, the final piece of the puzzle slides into place as Oracle reveals to Eve that he is the first of the Alpha Nativa, that he knows personally the Elder, and made a compact with him long ago. I'm not human. The first ever fusion between an Andro Ados and an I am the first of the Alpha Natibas. He offers up his Alpha Core as the fourth and final one needed for Eve to enter the nest, to confront the Elder Natiba herself. One obstacle stands between her and the deepest truth, Raven. The insane airborne member rails against Eve, but especially against Mother Sphere, who during the colony extinction ended the lives of millions. A merciless god whose servants are nothing but pawns and trash, data points in her logical brain. One can sympathize with Raven's fall from grace. Knowledge is dangerous to the ill-prepared mind. She also reveals that the legacies left, the lies espoused were all a ploy to bring Eve before the Elder. With Raven's defeat, Eve gains access to the nest. The Master Core opens the ancient stone doorway. Inside, an incomprehensible dream manifests. The nest is a natural breeding ground for Natibas. The Elder uses his power of creation to birth humanity's descendants. Docile, harmless, or unformed, these Natibas are different from those she has faced. As Eve approaches the inner chamber, she pierces the last mystery's veil. Standing before her is Adam. Adam is Raphael Marx. He is the Elder. He 
is the creator both of Mother Sphere and the Natibas. You mean... Yes. You and I. We are what is needed. Eve, I offer you one last deal. Let us become whole. One being. A single, evolved human species. There are three possible endings to Eve's tale. Each challenges her conceptions, tests her faith, and ultimately depends on her decisions. The crux of Eve's choice rests entirely on her view of humanity, and upon what foundation the species should stand. Are the Natibas the true inheritors of mankind, those who possess human DNA, whose ancestry is traced to the last humans, but who have succumbed to base instinct? allowing emotions to rule their minds and twist their bodies? Or should the Andro Eidos become humankind's successor? Beings resembling humans in appearance, bearing similar flesh and ruled by a higher logic, but manufactured from artifice, devoid of a soul, independent of their mechanical programming. Or perhaps there is a middle ground, a gray area between ends of the spectrum in which human existence might dwell. This is the area of conflicting hearts, of emotion against logic, and natural against unnatural. This is what both Adam and Mother Sphere desire, and it manifests in Eve. Here is an Andro Eidos perfected, an almost divine being that could succeed in both the Eve Protocol and in the Elder Natiba's mission to fuse a pristine hybrid. I've been researching for decades to find a way. A way for us all to become the inheritors of the human race. An Andro Eidos, with the most advanced unisonous hyperbody ever seen, and the ultimate Natiba that has not succumbed to its hostile instincts. These are the two necessary ingredients. Adam offers his hand in union so that they might transcend. If Eve denies Adam, he relents to his Natiba impulses and discards his humanity to fight in his true form. The Elder proves a most difficult adversary, but Eve overcomes him. With Adam slain, the nest is destroyed, and the Natibas either die off or are severely weakened. This line of humanity ends with him. In his dying breath, Adam bears no resentment, but only hopes that this is the right choice and preserving the best course. Mother Sphere, now connected to Earth through the network, descends to greet Eve and Lily. This was one of several possible futures, and one that Mother Sphere predicted, though a bittersweet ending as she laments the loss of her creator Raphael. In the final moments, Eve and Lily return to the colony but it's not what they imagined. Rather than some distant paradise, Mother Sphere has spent years crafting an orbital globe of metal to encase the Earth. To what end, we can only speculate. Some claim it's a Dyson Sphere-like apparatus meant to feed off the energy of the Earth, leaching organic matter to fuel the Andro Eidos designs. Personally, I think it might be a form of stellar defense mechanism, a shield to protect Earth from meteors, asteroids, or perhaps even alien and unknown threats. After all, it's Mother Sphere's directive to ensure the continuation of the species. But let me know your thoughts. If Eve accepts Adam's hand, the two unite in body and mind. The power and pedigree of the Natibas with a perfected human frame governed by the logic of the Andro Eidos. Eve retains her will, but becomes a new species, a Natiba android hybrid, which activates the weapon systems of Lily's colony mech. The machine attacks Eve, but just as with the elder Natiba fight, she proves superior. If insufficient exploration is completed, if Eve doesn't collect enough memory sticks or discover truth throughout the playthrough to trigger Lily's request to visit her old safe house, the machine systems can't be hacked and Lily is killed. Again, 
Following the confrontation, Mother Sphere descends and states that Eve's actions were another predicted possibility. This time, she says that the Eve Protocol is complete, suggesting that Mother Sphere and Raphael Marx both determined a combined and transcendent race to be the most desirable outcome. Only one more test remains. Eve must prove her resilience against an army of airborne Androidos. Finally, if Eve delves deep enough through side quests, data logs, and memory sticks, she uncovers sufficient truth Lily brings the trio to her hideout on Eidos 9, where she remained with her comatose compatriot, Iberis. This interaction spares Lily during the mech battle, as she's able to use Iberis's hacking software to free herself from the machine. Again, Mother Sphere states that the Eve protocol is complete, and that she must challenge Eve one final time. What's different is that with this ending, we see Eve return to Zion we see the final hypercell restore power to the city and awaken those long held in stasis within the cradle. A resplendent Eve appears as a guardian angel to invigorated Zion, its benevolent protector, and perhaps with the knowledge of Raphael Marx inside her, she might begin creating the new humanity. The world as it had been known is shattered. Humankind faced an existential threat and was forced to diverge down different paths of evolution. Interestingly, through Eve's actions, they converge once more, as metal is married to flesh, and emotion is reconciled with logic. The future of this new humankind is uncertain, but its present is certainly brighter than its past. Thanks so much for watching and listening to this video on the complete story of Stellar Blade. Now I want to hear from you. Let me know your thoughts on Eve, the lore of Stellar Blade, which ending you went for, as well as your own insights and suggestions for future videos in the comments below. And if you're a fan of lore and storytelling, be sure to subscribe to the channel, check out the podcast where content is uploaded frequently. I want to thank my amazing supporters over on Patreon, who make all of this possible, and I couldn't do it without their fantastic support. If you'd like to become a lore luminary for access to me, a great community, written scripts, and early video drops, Head to patreon.com slash the lorebrarians to learn more. Until next time, go forth and explore the lore.